Now our final speaker is Anthony Crosby Dawson. Anthony is a forestry expert, a former city fund manager and investment advisor with a firm called FIM, a specialist forestry firm who we've known personally for 17 years. And they've opened up the market to more investors through syndicated funds that allow investor to investors to participate with amounts of £40,000. Commercial timber is an asset that has shown excellent long-term growth, plus income, with fantastic tax advantages. It's another, it's another asset seldom mentioned by many investment advisors, but it's rapidly gaining recognition for its real asset qualities, high demand for the product and its role in portfolio diversify, diversification. So here, to separate the wood from the trees, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't resist it, is Anthony Crosby Dawson. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. I've not heard that one before, so that's a good, a good introduction. Thank you very much. Um, Steve, as you mentioned, has been a long-term supporter of FIM, and many of you here today are invested in one of our timber funds. Um, so I will give you a bit of an overview as to how forestry works. We at FIM are dealing with commercial forestry in the UK, so we're not dealing with the pretty broad leaves that you see out here, which are lovely to wander around in, but have very little commercial value. We're focused on plantation forestry, so commercial conifers, fast growing, multiple end uses. Um, I have also braved a presentation so I hope you got away without Trump treaty, uh, tweeting, Claudio, so hopefully he won't be tweeting about forestry in the next half an hour or so. Um, so uh, an overview. The returns are underpinned by biological growth. The trees are in the ground, they're growing. Rising timber prices are your potential upside. There's been a track record, as you can see at the bottom here, of very strong returns with low volatility. I haven't put gold on there, but I don't think Claudia and I were, I were talking, I don't think we'd fit the gold return on that graph, but you can see compared to other more mainstream asset classes that forestry has performed well and with relatively low volatility. Inflation is back in the news, 2.3% this week on conservative estimates. Most forecasters expect it to be 3% plus by the end of this year. Forestry acts as an inflation hedge. The trees we're dealing with are primarily Sitka spruce, as I mentioned, conifers. They have a flexible harvesting window, so it, it's not like you're a farmer, you've got a crop of wheat every year, you've got a harvest. Doesn't matter what the weather is. If the weather's been fantastic and there's loads of wheat, prices are depressed because there's too much. If the weather's been terrible, you haven't got much wheat to sell, but you've still got to sell it. Here, we can leave our trees on the stump if timber prices are low. Um, what are we selling our timber into? The domestic timber processing sector is a bit of an unsung success story, really. About a billion pounds has been invested over the past decade. And if you think of what else has gone on in the world in the past 10 years, to have such significant investment is quite an achievement. 150 million more that's actually happening at the moment. So your drivers of return. Biological growth of the crop. Whatever else is happening in the world, Brexit, Trump, Frexit, whatever it might be, the trees don't know this. They're in the ground. They're growing. They're growing while you're asleep. They're always growing. They're putting on, on average, about 5% per annum across the course of a 40-year rotation. So you've got that growth underpinning everything. You've then got the underlying land. We at FIM always buy forest freehold. We're a big believer that there's always going to be something you can do with land. Um, we've moved into renewable energy, which is part of that, which I'll come on to. But you own the land. As th there's obviously supply and demand affects land prices, but also as timber prices rise, the land becomes more productive and therefore more valuable. And finally, and this really is the key factor and the main driver of returns, the actual timber price. If timber prices continue to rise, then the asset class will continue to perform well. So looking at, looking at it globally, because timber is very much a globally traded commodity, 
Um, since the 2005 peak, consumption in the developed world has fallen about 25%. But at the same time, throughout the global financial crisis, consumption in the developing world has risen by nearly 30%. So net, the decrease globally in consumption has been minimal. We expect demand to rise significantly. Um, in the developing world, this is due to urbanization, more people moving to cities, uh, more buildings within those cities actually using timber more than steel and concrete, um, and also there's a strong correlation between GDP per capita and timber consumption per capita. So as people get richer, they use more timber, they have smart lecterns like this, whatever it might be. Coupled with this, in the developed world, we are now seeing a recovery post-financial crisis, um, which is driven by the recovery in house building, which I'll come on to. At the same time, you've got constraints on the supply side. So increasingly, buyers are demanding certified timber, which means it's certified as coming from a sustainable, sustainable source. So at FIM, forests that we manage on behalf of our investors, for every tree that's cut down, another two to three trees are planted within a year of the harvesting taking place. Sustainable. Chopping down the rainforest, obviously not sustainable. And there is increasing emphasis on sourcing timber from plantations in the developed world. So why invest now? Since the Brexit vote, we have seen a bounce in timber prices due to the fall in value of the sterling. Um, I looked at this again, actually, and it's a bit tenuous because it was rather a lot larger than dropped last time. But anyway, the, the, the point is that we, in the UK, it, we source about 80% of our annual consumption through imports. We can never grow enough, enough timber to fun, uh, source uh, enough timber to meet demand domestically. Um, so the cost of imports is important. But that, in a, in a way, is a very good thing because we've got a captive market. We can never grow enough timber to satisfy domestic demand. So a gap has emerged of 24% between uh, the cost of imported sawn timber and UK produced sawn timber, which obviously gives us as domestic growers potential to put up our prices. The main demand driver is housing starts. Housing starts, like many things, fell off a cliff in um, 2008. Um, but we're now gradually recovering. We're up to about 140,000. Politicians of all parties seem to agree that we need more houses. Uh, they, they don't necessarily have any solution as to how to deliver that, but they all say more houses are a good thing. Um, within the housing industry, more and more timber is being used. Timber is, of course, carbon neutral. New builds now have to be carbon neutral within the UK. So a great way to meet that goal is to use more timber, less steel, less concrete. Furthermore, timber frame construction is cheaper and quicker. So they build these houses off site, move them to site, and they're ready to go. The direction of travel is clear forecast to reach 32% by 2018 in Scotland, where they have rather more ambitious uh, carbon neutral targets. It's already 80% of new builds are timber frame. So returns, what do we target? FIM in the funds that we run, in which many of you are invested, we have a target return of 7% consisting of um, two a forecast of 2.5% real annual timber price increases. Over the past 10 years, timber prices in the UK have actually increased by nearly 5% per annum in real terms. So our forecast of 2.5% could be seen as conservative, 2.5% annual inflation. And then the remainder comes from the increase in value of the crop itself. So the trees are putting on about 5% growth terms per annum, which equates to about 2 to 2.5% in value terms. As discussed, FIM expect that um, timber price rises will be driven by rising demand and restricted supply, which should enable us to deliver better than 7% returns to our investors, as has been the case to date.
and an increase in timber prices, as mentioned, feeds through to higher land values as well. So the tree we're actually talking about, the, the, the whole um, processing sector in the UK is based around is Sitka spruce. It's the fastest growing. Average that we're dealing with is yield class 16. What does that mean? Yield class 16 means that the trees per hectare per annum are putting on 16 cubic metres of growth annually. This also, the six spruce, has the most amount of end uses. So starting at the bottom of the tree, the highest value part, the saw log, goes into the construction industry primarily, but then also garden decking, sheds, palleting. In the middle, you've got fencing, both domestically and agriculturally. And then at the top, the lowest grade part of the tree, you've got biomass and you've got pulp and chipboard and the relatively new market of biomass, which is providing competition for the low grade part of the tree. The harvesting window is about 15 years. So we're chopping down these trees between about the age of 35 to 50, which gives us the flexibility of the timber price, which like any commodity does oscillate. We don't have to harvest at times of wheat timber prices. So returns, the independent IPD index shows that um, on, over, in the long term, over 23 years, forestry has delivered 9% per annum. And this is before taking into account its significant taxation advantages. So the taxation advantages are numerous. After two years of ownership under business property relief, there's no inheritance tax payable. So it's out with your estate, so not, no 40% payable to HMRC. When cutting down the trees, there is no income tax or corporation tax payable. And the final advantage is no capital gains tax on the increase in value of the trees. There is capital gains tax on the increase in value of the underlying land, but at the time of maturity, when we're cutting these trees down, about 80% of the overall value is actually in the timber. <coughs> Bit of background on FIM. We were established in 1979, so we've been going for nearly 40 years. Um, initially fo focused on land and uh, forestry, but as mentioned, we did then move into renewable energy, which came about because developers came to us and said, a lot of your forests are in rather windy parts of the country, and we saw an opportunity to add value for investors. Our client base is private clients, family offices, and local authority pension funds as well. We've got about 800 million under management, primarily in the forestry, sector 75,000 hectares which is about 200,000 acres so that gives us um, real presence in terms of actually harvesting we control five to ten percent of the private sector harvest in the UK on an annual basis which means that we have very strong relationships with the timber buyers and can construct long-term contracts etc with them we're FCA authorized and regulated and ISO accredited so we structure these funds, FIM, um, so that they're unlisted vehicles, which protects the diversification benefits of forestry as an asset class, because many things that are listed these days seem to go up and down together. Um, and furthermore, it ensures that all of the taxation advantages through bor that you would get through buying a forest outright are also available through investing in one of the funds. The potential downside, of course, of that is that the funds are unlisted. So liquidity-wise, you can't sell them at the press of a button. You're reliant on FIM arranging deals between willing buyers and willing sellers. Um, pleasingly, to date, we've always done so successfully. Our average transaction time is 30 days between someone saying, sell my shares and the cash being in the bank. And importantly, again, historically, uh, share sales have always been at a premium to net asset value, so people haven't been having to get out at a discount. Returns to date have been strong um, above the 7%, the 6-7% target. Um, and uh, if timber prices continue to rise as forecast, then we should be able to continue to deliver similarly strong returns for our investors. 
We've got about 1,300 investors across the three funds with an average holding of about a quarter of a million, but the minimum investment is 40,000. So to conclude, forestry is an excellent portfolio diversifier and now a well-recognized addition to many um, investment portfolios. Um, it's got minimal correlation to bonds, equities, other listed asset classes, and it's positively correlated to inflation. The timber price outlook is very positive, which should result in continuing strong returns. And FIM is the leading UK forestry investment manager. Um, we've got unparalleled market information and unrivaled due diligence expertise from identifying the assets, going through the legal process, liaising with the lawyers to buy the assets, and then long-term management thereof on behalf of our clients. Uh, there's an FIM paper available summarising the benefits of UK forestry as an asset class in the foyer, so please do help yourself to one of those on the way out, and I'd be delighted to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. I have two questions but they are both related uh, in, in relation to uh, capital gains tax. First question is, under what circumstances would FIM consider disposing of any um, underlying land that it owns? And the second one is, I understand that the price of the shares has risen about <coughs> 34 pounds in the last year or two, does that mean, on the disposal of those shares, capital gains tax would be applicable? Um, on the first point, do you mean dispose of the land and keep the trees? No, no, no. Dispose, dispose of the whole asset, sell the whole asset. Um, you can't keep it, the trees if you dispose of the land. Well, you could, you could have a freehold on the trees, which some people do, and someone own the land. But no, we wouldn't want to do that, absolutely not. Um, so um, do we occasionally sell forests? Yes, but we prefer to keep them, restock after harvesting, and let investors benefit from the, 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 the growth in value of the trees um, and, and retain the land. So we prefer to pay the distributions, which are 3% tax-free per annum, our target distribution, which we, we do pay, um, through harvesting of trees rather than selling of assets. But the selling of assets after harvesting would always be a backup plan if necessary. But we'd prefer not to because we think forestry values will keep rising. Would you sell them? Only if we needed to in order to pay the distribution. So if, if uh, and, and that would then come down to a, a judgment call which we would put to investors. Would you prefer to sell an asset in order to have the 3% income or would you prefer to forego some of the 3% income? Um, but we haven't been in that scenario where we haven't been able to pay the distribution from harvesting. And we, uh, of course, of the view that uh, forestry values are going to continue rising, so we'd prefer not to sell any of the assets if possible. Um, second question, CGT. Um, the, so we provide a breakdown upon sale of shares when any investor sells shares as to what element is subject to CGT and what element isn't. And as I said, at maturity, 80% is in the trees, so most of your growth is in the trees and therefore exempt from CGT. I think your very first point was that your asset is a biological product that grows inevitably all the time as a, as a major advantage. Yep. But um, presumably there are risks associated with it being a biological product, e.g., its uh, susceptibility to the, the dreaded citrus boring beetle that could wipe out your asset in the course of a year. How do you deal with that? Uh, yeah, so, uh, but yes, absolutely, any, any crop that has um, biological risk. We insure against fire and wind blow damage. We can't insure against pests and disease because there is no known pest and disease that affects Sitka spruce trees in the UK. Um, we are an island which helps on that front. Um, if any pest or disease was identified that was a threat, it would be swiftly dealt with as the whole industry is based around the spruce trees. 
Um, but as you say, like any biological investment, pest and disease is your biggest risk, yeah. But FIM been doing this for 40 years, there never has been any pest or disease or any problem. The formula that you've used so far appears to work pretty well. What's the availability of new land for planting new trees like? Um, getting better. Uh, so in the 70s and 80s, a lot of land was planted with trees, and that's what's being harvested now, 40 odd years later. Um, in the 90s, new planting fell off a cliff um, because the tax breaks for planting you could no longer offset against income tax, um, and that's when the inheritance tax relief came in to replace that. Um, so then people <coughs> stopped planting new trees. So the Forestry Commission, which is the state body that owns about 50% of um, the forestry within the UK, have um, commissioned a study which showed that from about 2030 onwards, the supply of timber in the UK is going to start declining quite significantly, which is no bad thing if you own timber at that junction. Um, what have I lost? It's not from the spruce tree, is it? <laughs> no, 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 they're sturdy. Um, um, so, uh, yes, so that's a fine thing if you own timber, if you're a forestry investor, there's going to be less supply, so the price of your timber is going to go up. Um, not ideal if you're a processing mill who's reliant upon sourcing the product. Um, and so, you know, probably about 20 years late, government have started waking up to the fact that there's a bit of an impending uh, shortage looming. And the Scottish government, um, I wouldn't say I agree with all that much of what the SMP say and do, but they are very pro-forestry. And they've recently increased their target um, up from 10,000 hectares of new planting per annum to 15,000. Now, of course, they got nowhere near the 10,000 anyway, but, you know, by the by, they, they, at least they sort of seem enthusiastic. And they are giving grants to convert low-grade agricultural land, which has a couple of sheep running around on it, and isn't much use to anyone, into actually produ productive forestry. <laughs> so it's long answer, but it's getting better, basically. <laughs> we're, we're finding more places to plant, and we do do that on behalf of investors. It's obviously higher risk, you're converting, you're you know, reliant on securing the grants, etc. But we've delivered some large scale projects in the last few years of you know, 1,000 hectares, that sort of thing for investors. And Wales, hopeless, you can't get anything done. But England and Scotland are, are, are becoming easier. Thank you. Last question, anyone? This is just a point of explanation. I didn't understand something you said about um, forestry having a 5% growth, and you mentioned something about rotation. Ah, yes. What, what does that mean? Well, a rotation is from planting to felling. So on average, that would be about 40 years. So from sticking, sticking the tree in the ground to cutting it down, um, <coughs> it, we have a harvesting window between 35 to 50 years, roughly. So you've got about a 15-year spread. But on average, we'd look to, look to harvest age 40. Um, and so across that 40-year rotation, on average, the trees are putting on 5% growth per annum. So the, the real growth spurt is generally about 20 to 30, when they'd be putting on closer to 10% per annum. But if you look across the 40, yeah, average is out at about 5%. Thank you. <coughs>